This is a video introduction to EDTA titrations, which is material from Chapter 11 of your Analytical Chemistry textbook. EDTA titrations are a form of complexometric titrations, in which you're forming a complex between your titrant and your analyte. In general, the equilibrium that we're worried about here is uh, a metal ion of some kind represented by M reacting, forming a complex with a ligand, which is denoted L here, to give the metal ligand complex shown in the reaction. The equilibrium constant for this reaction is known as Kf, the formation constant, and we want it to ideally be large. Uh, this comes from our rule for titrations that they should go to completion. L is the ligand and it's a Lewis base, uh, an example of which is EDTA. And then the metal ion uh, is the corresponding Lewis acid. Depending on how the ligand connects to the metal ion, uh, we designate them as either monodentate or multidentate. So monodentate ligands attach to the metal ion through one electron pair. Multidentate attaches through more than one. EDTA attaches through six. It's a hexadentate ligand. Now, what could be misleading, you should not be misled, uh, multidentate versus monodentate ligands does not change the stoichiometry of the reaction between the metal and the ligand. It only changes the, the behavior of how they attach. But the mole ratio between the ligand and the metal is generally one to one, no matter what uh, the charge on the metal ion is. And this is the case for the EDTA calcium titration that you did in experiment five, for example. I mentioned that the equilibrium constant for this reaction is called Kf, the formation constant. Uh, it's a one, for a one-to-one -one reaction, um, you see the equilibrium constant here. I specify one-to-one -one because there are no stoichiometric coefficients in there. Uh, but in general, this is defined the same way as any K, you know, Ka or whatever, all the ones we've done before. The specific ligand that we're going to talk about and that you used in experiment five is EDTA and it's really the most common ligand in analytical chemistry. The form of it specifically that binds to calcium is shown here in this reaction. It's called the Y4 minus form, uh, meaning that it has lost four of those protons. Uh, the Kf is given there. The problem though with this formation constant is that not all EDTA is in this form Y4 minus. It can exist in many other forms and each of these forms, the transitions between them, have their own Ka. This is just deprotonation. The Y4 minus, the concentration, the ratio, the amount of our EDTA that's in this form is a function of pH. And so we need to have some way of accounting for this, that the, P, the change in the pH will result in a change in that concentration, which will then result in a change in the formation constant. So we need to know the mole fraction of EDTA that's in each form as a function of pH. The way we express this with the formation constant is by using a thing called a conditional formation constant, which modifies Kf, the original Kf, to account for the fact that not all of the EDTA may be in the correct form to complex with the metal ions. So the, uh, the change here is the addition of this alpha Y4 minus term. And alpha Y4 minus is the fraction of the ligand that's in the correct form. So alpha Y4 minus times total concentration equals concentration in the Y4 minus form. We can use a buffer like you did in experiment five so that this fraction is basically constant. It may not be one, may not have all the EDZA in the correct form, but at least it's basically constant. And in this case, we get Kf prime, which is called the conditional formation constant. This allows us to use just the total concentration of EDTA when calculating the conditional formation constant. So when we do a titration with EDTA, it's going to look, the curve is going to look just like the strong acid, strong base titration curves that we saw before. You can either build this curve with uh, an indicator electrode, or you can build it with uh, some sort of in, uh, indicator like you did in experiment five. If you really want to make a curve though, you need the electrode, and you can buy ion selective electrodes for several metals. In any case, this is still going to have the same regions as we talked about for an acid-base titration curve, before the equivalence point, at the equivalence point, 
and after the equivalence point. This can change, though, as a function of pH. And the reason that the shape of the curve can change as a function of pH is because alpha y4 minus changes as a function of pH, and therefore the amount of EDTA that's available to complex with, for example, calcium, changes if, for the same amount of EDTA as a function of pH. Uh, so the curve actually looks a little different. It has the same shape every time, but the place where P calcium levels off is different every time, and therefore the position of the inflection point is going to be a little different. This is a small effect because the slope of the titration curve is so steep near the endpoint. But it's real. It's a real noticeable effect, especially for a larger change in pH, like between 7 and 10. In either case, the important thing to know is that it's possible that not all of the EDTA in solution is available to complex with the calcium. And so when you do an experiment like this, you need to buffer the solution so that alpha Y4 minus is constant and ideally large.